This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Thursday, December 6th of 2018, it's episode 143. In this episode, author and game designer Greg Stoltze joins us to talk about systematically planning for good gaming sessions, plus the time commitment for podcast episodes, Greg's Termination Shock and Grim War Kickstarters, and much more. Hey, listeners, we're releasing this episode early for two good reasons. First, because it was scheduled to drop on Christmas Day 2018, and most of you would be spending time with family and opening presents and rejoicing and worshiping rather than listening to podcasts. Long drives to family accepted, perhaps. Second, Greg Stoltz's Kickstarter for Termination Shock, which you'll hear us talk about in this episode, ends on Christmas Day. And we wanted to get this out early enough that you could back the Kickstarter or maybe give it as a last-minute gift to someone. So, yeah, consider this episode an early Christmas present from all of us to you and yours. Merry Christmas, folks, and God bless. Welcome to Saving the Game. I'm Grant. I'm Peter. I'm Jenny. And this is Greg Stolze. Greg, we're delighted to have you back. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Good. You doing all right? I'm okay. I'm looking forward to the Christmas season, in part because I don't have to drive anywhere this year. But, uh, and, you know, also in part because, eh, you know, Christmas season. Yeah, Christmas. Yeah. It's a, a fun time for most people. Well, Greg, um, in case somebody does not know who you are, take a moment, if you would, and just kind of introduce yourself. Talk about uh, who you are and uh, the games you've designed and that sort of thing. Well, I started my game design career in like 1996 because uh, I met Jonathan Tweet while I was in college and he was an insurance salesman. And I'd always wanted to be a writer. And as soon as I found out there was a guy I n actually knew who was getting paid to write for money, I'm like, oh, I got to exploit this. <laughs> uh, so I, I freelanced for a while and I wrote for the World of Darkness for a while. And I uh, got in early working with John Tynes on Unknown Armies, which is kind of a, a horror game for dirty, deranged, damaged people. Uh, and uh, from there, worked on, uh, you know, a lot more White Wolf stuff, developed a set of mechanics called the One Roll Engine that I'm pretty proud of, uh, that started out as a gritty World War II, but with superheroes game called Godlike, got expanded to a generic superheroes game called Wild Talents, I clawed it off on my own and made a fantasy game called Rain, which is getting its second edition in the new year. I just saw one of the new book covers and man, it is gorgeous. Oh, I was so disappointed when financial issues came up and I could not back that. I You, oh, you can I still love... get in on it, man. Good. That is good to hear because I know what I'm doing for Christmas for myself now. <laughs> yeah. I we... loved the first edition, just to be clear. Well, good. So. Uh, the, the second edition is not majorly changed, but I'm uh, I'm finally getting other people to uh, write to the mechanics, and it's uh, it's really uh, it's really fun to share. And hmm. uh, I have I haven't always been super generous with that, but it's it's good to watch someone what someone else is doing with my toy box. So uh, yeah, after Rain and Unknown Armies, worked on Delta Green. And, uh, you know, uh, other minor projects, I did a film noir version of uh, the One Roll Engine called A Dirty World. And right now I'm running a Kickstarter for my next all new set of game mechanics. And uh, it's for a science fiction game called Termination Shock. Right. So I was really curious about Termination Shock. Tell us a little bit about this. Um. It was basically me designing the science fiction game I'd always wanted to play. And as we've worked on it, when I first started out with it, it was going to be this very grim, dyspeptic, dingy, typically Stolzian game, if there is such a thing. And then uh, the two playtesters I got who have, have, you know, were co-writers on another project – their first instinct was, well, you know what this needs is a dose of the Fraser Crane vibe. And hmm. so they they developed these characters who were like half Niles Crane and half Han Solo. <laughs> and it turned out to 
be actually a really, really good match for the mechanics because they're pretty... When you go to the dice, sometimes the dice will just take you in a direction you didn't entirely expect. And so having the tone be a little lighter makes that a little easier to roll with. Right. Okay. It's interesting. I don't know if this is just the result of my skimming or if this is kind of intentional, but I almost got a tiny little bit of a Titan AE vibe off of it when I was reading over the summary. I don't think I've watched Titan AE. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Fair. The the whole like humanity is cosmic refugees thing really um, was kind well, of the, the common thing there because the, the premise of Titan AE is that Earth gets destroyed by alien invaders, but a bunch of humans escape. They can't go home again because okay. there's no home. <laughs> No, that that does sound very, very relevant, man. I should probably check that out. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I watched it and just forgot that I had. But yes, Old the um, movie. sort of the setup. You could play the game in its sort of early grim dark half of the setting. I'm vaguely thinking that you know you can play sort of the early game before humans are rescued. The later game as humans get integrated into the wider cosmos and then you know later still when oh yeah everyone knows what a human are humans are they're they're the ones who are preoccupied with sex all the time the hairless <laughs> monkey people you know <laughs> those weird bipeds one thing that came up that was very fun in the early play to in in the uh, the session i ran was that almost all the aliens they met were monosexual and so they're like what is this male female thing i uh I kind of uh, ambushed one of the players with having a, an alien he'd just met say, can you explain masculine and feminine to me? And I just listened to him stammer for like the next 15 <laughs> minutes. It was great. <laughs> uh, that's, that's amazing. Aces. That is absolutely aces. <laughs> so, yeah, but the, the premise is that in the solar system at the very beginning of the setting, there's sort of three groups and one group is the the wealthy humans of earth and venus who have availed themselves of mind enhancing technologies that operate on subwaves which are the sort of hand wavium of the setting and so they have have glorified themselves and made themselves super smart and when they talk to you their perceptions are so keen and their charisma is so great that you just find yourself nodding along and saying, yeah, you know, that makes sense. I, I really shouldn't be allowed to have all the opportunities you do. Thanks for explaining that. You're the best. And so, you know, that's group one. Group two is AI powered robots out in the uh, orbit of Saturn who have pretty much just gone berserk and are trying to kill all humans. The standard trope. And so sandwiched in between them. You have the people living on Mars and the people living in the asteroid belt who are not allowed the subwave technologies of self-improvement. And uh, what in the text I call the big event is just as a huge fleet of killbots is descending on Mars and the asteroid belt, suddenly from nowhere there is this weird collection of uh, strange-looking ships and aliens pour out of them and say, come with me if you want to live and sweep the humans out beyond the termination shock. Termination shock is the point at the edge of the solar system where the solar wind gives way to the cosmic wind. And as soon as I saw that that was an actual scientific term, I'm like, well, there's that's got to be a title for something. <laughs> yeah. And so once they're out past the shock, what they find out is that, oh, actually, soul is really a kind of rare place. Uh, subwaves react differently there. And so that's why the AIs and the ex-humans were able to use them to enhance their intellects because uh, they, they work weird. But out here, as soon as they left that radius, their vastly improved intelligence would just conk out. And the regular humans are like, oh, so what do subwaves do out here? Oh, faster than light communication. Really more like location agnostic communication. Here, have an Ansible. So there was this scene where they're just lined up and their alien benefactors hand each of them. I think they got like a blanket, a bottle of water, this big nutritious cracker and 
some weird object that they didn't know what it was. <laughs> and it's they're all looking and one of them's like, mine looks like a jade disc. And one's like, mine looks like a metal box. And one's like, I got this this shiny mirrored oblong. And then they all switch on and it's like, this is your Ansible. This is basically your interstellar cell phone. Please do not fall for email scams. Beautiful. <laughs> this will be able to translate your language to alien language. But uh, when the aliens spoke, every word had been sectioned out of some piece of media. So it all sounded like, uh, you know, these weird sound collages, except every once in a while they'd hit the perfect phrase they needed. So <laughs> you know, when they were rescued, they all heard Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, Come with me if you want to live. <laughs> <laughs> that, Terminator that in Termination Shock. Okay. That's it. <laughs> there we go. I'm getting a, a little bit of a Dan Simmons vibe off this, which delights me. I haven't read a lot of Dan Simmons. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Every time I tell people about this, they're like, oh, that sounds like X. And I'm like, I haven't read it. But all right. <laughs> well, well that's kind of a good down. thing. Because I, I feel like it's hitting certain really big markers of media that I absolutely adore. Because Hyperion is probably one of my favorite sci-fi novels of all time. And I'm not alone in that. It's okay. remarkable. And so anytime I'm going, oh, yeah, this sounds like Hyperion, but maybe crossed a little bit with Hitchhiker's Guide. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And like, I'm, you know, when I'm sitting here going, these are two flagship sci-fi novels in a role-playing game that I want to play. That seems promising. Yeah. Now that I think about it, now, Hitchhiker's Guide, I have read probably multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, it came into my life at a very vulnerable point in my development. Thinking about it, I'm like, yes, the Arthur Dent position of just constantly being thrown unprepared into circumstances that he just doesn't even grasp. I'm like, that's it. That's the termination shock experience. Right. That's perfect, though, because Arthur Dent is the perfect player character in an environment <laughs> like that where it's like, well, I don't know anything. Great. You're well prepared. <laughs> uh, if Arthur Dent was a player character, he'd have a skill at like Kukri knife at 55 percent for no reason. But I see what I see what you're getting at. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I mean, like, you know, not ha I'm, I'm prepping to run an Eberron game. And that's one of those settings where I'm having to dump massive amounts of setting detail mm -hmm. on the players. Whereas in this case, it's like, uh, what do we need to know about the game? Everything we just heard in the past five minutes and then everything else you're expected to learn and play because the fun is going to be, uh, what did this button just do? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I, I wrote up in the book is the idea of technarbians, which is technological barbarians. And it, it suggests that the Martians and the miners in the asteroid belt are very ignorant about culture because there's only so much learning time you've got in these very harsh and uh, pretty merciless circumstances. And so, yeah, if you learn about history and sociology, then you're not going to know what to do when the air recirculator conks out. And so there's this heavy privileging of technological ability over an understanding of the past. And in both the games we've played, we've had these moments where it's just uh, where characters completely and confidently garble the history of Earth. It's like, <laughs> oh, yes, this is Thanksgiving when we celebrate the liberation of the country of Turkey by eating the animal <laughs> turkey. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> that, is, oh, yes. that almost <laughs> sounds like a precursor to the Adeptus Mechanicus in Warhammer 40k. This is Miller time, which is a saying we say to honor Arthur Miller, who wrote <laughs> Tropic of Capricorn. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I am delighted. It's fun. Yeah, it sounds like it. Okay, well, that, that sounds fantastic, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this a little bit more, because I think we're going to sure. be using Termination Shock as an example for our main topic, which I'm excited about. Did we want to talk about Grim War as well? Okay, so Termination Shock is, as we record this, on Kickstarter, not quite at halfway to the completion of its funding, which has me very anxious. In a fit of I know not what motivation, I set it, I set the Kickstarter to end on Christmas Day. 
So, so now I always know how many days it is till Christmas, at least. Um, <laughs> convenient. But yes, uh, early in 2019, next year, I'm going to launch another Kickstarter for the second edition of Grim War. The first one was a, uh, a setting for Wild Talents. And so it was a superhero game that basically suggested that the major conflict was wizards versus mutants. And the inspiration behind Grim War was looking at uh, kind of the X-Men era Marvel comics where it's like, oh, everyone hates mutants. And I'm like, but they're completely OK with Doctor Strange. You know, everyone accepts that. Oh, yeah. Sorcerer Supreme. He's great. <laughs> right. And so I kind of wanted to invert that and suggest that with the right PR, everyone would love mutants and everyone would be like, oh, the mutants, they're great. They're terrific. They're everyday folks just like you and me, except, you know, that they can teleport and that they would immediately get co-opted by the government. <laughs> so one option in Grim War is, oh, yeah, you're mutants. You work for the government. You round up these evil books full of spells, throw them in the fire, and then it's Miller time. <laughs> uh, the other option is that... You can play as the sorcerers who gain their powers by invoking or repelling spirits. And so, whereas the mutant powers are very specific and physical, the wizardly powers are all very subtle and invisible and usually involved with tweaking opportunity. When you're not a wizard, the wizards seem to be the people who never have a bad hair day and everything turns out their way. And just as they pull in, they get the parking spot and always know the right thing to say and never trip on their own shoelaces. But of course, are breaking the law and, you know, are despised by society at large. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of like, you know, OK, choose your option. So this is Mage the Ascension versus rising stars via fahrenheit 451 <laughs> uh it's it's not real there's not much of a fahrenheit 451 vibe it's set you know in the modern day and okay. you know this gives you the avenue that uh you can bring a lot of sort of the current political moment into the game that's actually what i was immediately jumping to was <laughs> oh you know here are these elites who have gotten their gotten their good fortune through illegal sorcery and you have the the demagoguery against yep. that sort of thing that immediately well stood but out. and at the same time you know there are lots of examples in the setting where it's like oh yeah lots of wizards are awful it is not hard if you study these arts to become very detached and merciless towards normal people and look at them the way you'd look at something growing in a petri dish uh sure one of yeah. the mechanics i worked up for the new and so with the new version of Grim War, the old one was a wild talent setting that was based on the very physics emulation mechanics in wild talents. And I found that that made it a little cumbersome. So for the new version, it's going to be a standalone game. It's still going to work off the one roll engine, but I've streamlined a lot of stuff that in retrospect, I'm like, eh, maybe people don't want to get five rolls deep before they achieve this particular task. And maybe people don't want to have to handcraft every superpower for their characters. Uh, so mm -hmm. now you just, you know, if you're a mutant, you pick off a list of mutations. And, uh, you know, if you are a sorcerer, conjuring up spirits to defend you is a lot simpler. So uh, one of the things I was able to add was a social combat mechanic. And where it's, you know, if people are able to subject you to terrible psychological pressure, you start out by defining three traits for yourself that give you little little rules bonuses. But if you undergo terrible psychological damage, you lose these traits. And what they're replaced with is what society expects from you. Uh, and it's what society expects from you at your worst. So if you're a mutant and you lose one of your traits, you become sybaritic. And instead of being a little bit better at something, you're a little bit worse at telling when people are lying to you because all you're concerned about is your own pleasure. And uh, if you're a wizard and you lose one of these traits, uh, you can become arrogant 
And now you just can't connect with other people or persuade them because you regard them all as insects. And uh, if you are neither a wizard or a mutant and lose one of these traits, you run the risk of becoming cringing or deferential. And you just, you know, your your whole sense of self implodes. And you're like, oh, I guess I just better do what my betters tell me to do. So hmm. I really like that. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. I also I have to say, like, I love the phonetic trick in the the title of it, where it's written out as two words, Grim War, but Grimoire, Book of Magic, Grimoire. which is the, you know, the default MacGuffin for your games in it. If you don't know what you're going to do this session, it's like, oh, well, you hear that there's a book of spells and people want it. Go. <laughs> cool. No, that sounds fascinating and something I need to look well, into as well. It, you'll you'll be able to pledge for it on Kickstarter early in 2019. Delightful. I will make sure to share that out once we uh, yes. catch up with that. It'll be great. <laughs> as soon as I recover from running this one. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. I've not run a Kickstarter. I understand they are stressful. Yeah, it's anxiety producing. Was it you that that said on Twitter that Kickstarter is an engine for turning anxiety into it cash? Feel, yeah, that was me. I said it feels like that and that you don't know what uh, the exchange okay. rate is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, I want to encourage people who are listening to this episode right as it comes out, which should be before Christmas, because we're going to try and get this out early, partly to avoid Christmas Day and also because... Part of the goal of having Greg on is to give our listeners a chance to hear about these things and pledge and support Thank them. You. So we're going to try and get this out before Christmas. So I will make sure there is a link to the Termination Shock Kickstarter in the show notes and keep an eye on our social media feed. We'll try and share out uh, the Grim War second edition. One Molto as well. grazie. So you're going to fully in no like problem. some sleigh bells every time someone says Christmas, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, no, I don't that, have that kind of time. Yeah, no, that would be the role of my cat if she were in the room right now. Oh, do That's you a, have? Do you ever belled? Uh, no, she just likes a a bell toy. Fair enough. And she she was causing chaos earlier. That's why this is the first uh, episode in a bunch of months that she is not in the room. Who will bell the cat? Oh man, the cat did it to itself. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a cat to do about anything if you cover it in enough catnip. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our Patreon right. question. Uh, but let me go ahead and roll for this. And by the way, I just want you to know, Greg, I'm rolling my uh, Unknown Armies backer uh, kit Sweet. dice here. So here we go. So this is from Tom Stevens, Patreon backer, who asks, how much time do each of you spend researching, recording, and editing for an average episode? This is more a personal question I'm interested in as I'm considering starting up a podcast. Convenient. Yeah. This actually kind of works out because, Greg, I would like to hear how much time you had to spend working on the Termination Shock podcast. Um, okay. So each game session is between usually like an hour or closer to two hours. And we record the whole thing, except when our voice over internet protocol crashes or someone's microphone uh, conks out or we have other technical difficulties. Sure. So recording, it's like 90 minutes. When I was editing it myself, it was kind of a nightmare. It would probably take me <laughs> like two hours for every 45 minutes of recorded time, maybe more. So mm -hmm. I farmed that out to Ross Payton, who Good choice. does a really nice job for money. So, yeah, if if what my recommendation is, if you are going to run a podcast, hire it done. You can teach yourself to do it, but, oh, it's a it's a picky job and it's not for everyone. And you need to have that really intense concentration and, and attention span and, a, you know, attention to detail and just the time to pour into it. Pro yeah. tip have either ADHD or autism and make it your special interest. <laughs> oh. And then you can hyper focus for like hours. This is this is what I did when um I I don't talk about this very much on the podcast. I will not openly give out the URL, but I briefly did a vlog in the first two-ish years 
of university. They are the cringiest vlogs you will ever see. Uh, go, go ahead and try to find them if you like. It's not I super hard. Them. I'm glad you enjoyed them. I can't I've watch them anymore. I've never seen these. Well, you know. Oh, you're cool. Good. Congratulations <laughs> um, on having done them. And, uh, you know, I... I that yeah. could sound it was that could sound sarcastic, but you know, you yeah. really have to be willing to make a fool of yourself if you're ever going to improve at anything. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And like I don't look back at them and be like, oh wow, look at the bad editing. Like for the software I had and the hardware I had, I did some darn good stuff. It's just like this was a really embarrassing time of my life kind of thing. <laughs> and it was like the only <laughs> hobby that I could do in a very small dorm room because most of my other hobbies at the time were like sewing on a sure. sewing machine, which involves just like so much cloth and nobody else around me or a couple people wanted to play D&D, but different play style than I really liked. So most of my hobbies were like not there. And I was just like, I need a creative outlet. So I started blogging. Anyway, for me, because my computer was so slow, I couldn't edit by video because the video just wouldn't show on the editing software it would show like individual oh, frames no. every 30 seconds or so so um yeah i edited mostly by audio uh making jump cuts here and there and it turned out okay and it was a good fun time but yeah i would spend multiple hours trying to like just drag sliders in the right direction back and forth and, and stuff like that I will say, going from Windows Movie Maker, which is what I started with, to uh, Adobe Premiere, uh, I have, like, the baby version of Adobe mm -hmm. Premiere. It, it was a bit of a learning curve, but wow, it was, like, it, once I did learn it, it was so much easier. I, I was able to, in the end, save a lot of time by just getting decent editing my, software. Oh, I was yeah. going to say, my videos are all done on uh, iMovie, which I don't mm. know how good it is or not, because I... You know, it's all I've ever known. I've heard that the interface on iMovie is a lot friendlier than Premiere. Premiere is very much like sort of cold and <laughs> hard to to get through. It's a harsh looking dark gray. Like it's not a friendly interface, but you get used to it. <laughs> it's fair. Actually, Grant, why don't you let me take this? Because you probably have the most to say and I can wreck it through mine pretty fast. OK, go, go for so, it. So. I have done the editing for the podcast before, and it usually took me about four times the amount of time in the actual audio file to get through that. I think Grant might be a little faster than that at this point, but it took a while to get there. We usually spend somewhere between an hour apiece and an hour total researching individual episodes, although for some of them, like the Historical Heresies series, that has stretched out much, much longer. Sure. And uh, recording usually is about... 10 to 25 percent longer than the finished product we cough we have the podcast train come through various stuff where we just trip over our words and start over again happens so yep. there's a little bit of set up and tear down uh, mm -hmm. at the start and end of each episode yep. one thing we do for example is we record you know 15 20 seconds of room tone which we use to filter out hisses and hums and that sort of thing and there's the usual setup of is everybody recording yeah. Let's sync up all of our tracks. That's See, I haven't done a lot with the room tone. I would try and fix that in Audacity, and everything would sound like it was coming from the bottom of a well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Audacity is not as good, but if you use the right settings on those filters, which I did for years and years, and actually uh, we have on our blog a whole write-up that Peter did on editing and all that in Audacity and starting a podcast, which I'll make sure to link in the show notes as well. You actually did one on uh, marketing the podcast, too, at the end of that series, so I should probably throw that in there while you're at yeah. it. Yeah, well, that whole series, I think, is linked, so just, you know, yeah, it's like uh, look at that whole yeah, stuff. five posts or something like that total. Exactly. So, yeah, not a whole lot to add on the researching or recording. For editing, recently, we or I switched to using Reaper, which uh, for a small project is only like $60. Uh, that's one of the first things we put our Patreon money to, and it helped enormously. Reaper, much like, you know, the difference between Windows Movie Maker and Adobe Premiere, it is a step up in complexity from Audacity. Uh, this is software that people use for, you know, recording whole albums or things like that, right? It can be very powerful. But the ability to create your own automations and do lots and lots of steps with the press of one button is awfully nice. 
Uh, and there are a number of good tutorials for podcasting um, and setting those up. The ability to apply effects chains non-destructively to tracks is delightful. So I can create filters and rebalance things. And then if I need to, I can turn those off and just have the raw audio and nothing has actually been changed. All of this is extremely handy. Uh, it used to take me upwards of 12 hours to edit an hour long audio file, but that's because I was obsessively going through and cutting out every oh. um and uh and break and pause. Oh, and that man, sort of that thing. Would... I have tried to get better about that. <laughs> I can't promise I've done it exactly um <laughs> that way madness lies <laughs> that was how i did the podcast for the first five years oh man yeah and uh yeah that was not the smartest decision i ever made but there we go i still do cut out a lot of those to the point where i can now recognize ums and uhs from how they appear <laughs> visually uh, <laughs> on the waveform I learned to do that, too, and I was only editing every other episode for a while there, so... Yeah, I mean, once you figure them out, it's easy enough. That's not easy enough for me. I see them a lot. We're, we're a bunch of that. maniacs, but... Yeah. And also, we um and what a this, lot. What uh, everyone mm. does, uh. um, like I just did now, uh, <laughs> what, what I was going to say, what this reminds me of is sort of an insight I've had about uh, creativity generally, is that... You are not going to last unless you enjoy the process and not just the outcomes that mm. if you like to have paintings and you you can even be very good at painting, but you hate the process of painting, it will destroy you trying to be a painter. If you don't, oh, yeah, if absolutely. you don't actually like sitting alone in a room looking at a blank screen and filling it with words you are not going to cut it as a writer and you shouldn't want to yeah. oh yeah like i i did not go into vlogging to become you know the next youtube whatever i went into vlogging because i liked editing <laughs> like i, I get a, a certain amount of joy from doing the perfect jump cut like i enjoy yep. that and if you don't enjoy making that perfect jump cut uh, good luck. It's, it's process. <laughs> yeah. Um, just today, I, uh, I I started writing a short story, and it turned out to be thirteen thousand words long, which is <laughs> which is right at the most awkward, unpublishable length. Uh, Ooh. And yeah. it's over that ten thousand mark. Yeah, and <laughs> but it's not. It's nowhere near a novel, so it's like a novelletto or something. But <laughs> what the story's about is that it follows three characters, two of whom work for the FBI. One is an agent on the serial killing task force. One is their IT person who you know keeps their laptops working and does database searches. And as a hobby, the database searcher does uh, lino cut prints, which is you know, something I myself do. So that so that I knew about that I could write about from something other than a position of full ignorance. And then the third point of view is the horrific serial killer they're chasing. And what I try to do with this story is show how their processes are all largely parallel, and that it's all a matter of just really careful setup. Focusing on the task you need to do right now, and you just pick away at it constantly, and there's never any big, sweeping, dramatic movement. It's all just tiny, tiny incremental actions. And, you know, even for the serial killer, it's okay. After two months of observation, I've decided who my victim is going to be. Now I have to get in a position where I am invisible to them because they're so used to me being around that they don't even think about me. And then comes the snatch and grab. So I'm going to do something with that someday because I put, because I put so many words in it <laughs> yeah. to, to do nothing. I, I, it's a sunk cost fallacy. Well, you know, and I think it's a good story. That sounds interesting. Yeah. We'll see yeah. what people say. Um, I've got uh, my brother, who is both a nurse and a former electrical engineer, looking at it, as well as uh, a friend who's a CSI, and uh, then Shane <coughs> Ivey for the FBI details. Oh, okay. Very cool. One last thing on editing. I want to point out that I have reduced that time from like the, the 12 hours per hour to about four hours, I would say. 
just through better tools and lightening uh-huh. up slightly and letting a few more mistakes in, making it sound more natural. And not only has that made my life significantly better and my marriage <laughs> significantly better. It has also, I think, increased the quality of the podcast because we sound more natural. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, I've heard listeners remark about that where they were saying that for a while we would occasionally release like a bonus episode where we did almost no editing at all. And I forget who it was, but they were like, yeah, it would be nice to hear that a little more often. Your average episodes are just edited to the point where you don't even really sound Like you're having a conversation. Edited into the uncanny valley. Yeah, (laughs) a little bit of that. So I've tried to back off that. Well, there's there's a saying, the perfect is the enemy of the done. So (laughs) at some point you just have to stop picking at it. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) And on that note, Tom, thank you for your question. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. If you want to support us on Patreon, just go to patreon.com slash saving the game. And for only a dollar a month, you too get to send in random questions, which we roll on and have fun with. All right, let's uh, read our scripture real quick. All right. uh, This is Leviticus 1934. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you are foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And that is a specific nod to humanity's status as refugees in Termination Shock. As Leviticus quotes go, that one seems so much more relevant than like the paragraph where it describes, okay, when you perform the sacrifice, you have to do this with the kidney (laughs) fat. Not that, not the other thing. Exactly this. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Well, at least to us. Yeah. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter four, verses six through seven. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom, though it cost all you have, get understanding. And Proverbs 15, verse 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. And finally we have Luke chapter 6, verses 39 to 40. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So, Greg, one of the things that you brought up when you were you and I were emailing mm-hmm. back and forth talking about coming on the show was that both Termination Shock and Grim War have something that you have put a lot of effort into, which is specific, hard, practical advice for GMs to take into session prep and session right. building. Right. There was something that uh, th- this was sort of a, a combination of several observations coming together. As I've quoted before, someone said that Everway would have been as successful as Dungeons and Dragons if they'd found a way to pack Jonathan Tweed or John Tynes in every box to run the game for you. So that's like <laughs> one leg of this conceptual stool. Uh, another was Mike Merles's quote that he had this elaborate metaphor where he's like, imagine two people, one who likes to listen to pop music on the radio and one who is a hardcore jazz aficionado with a whole room full of old vinyl records who obsessively listens to them. And now imagine the obsessive jazz fiend making a mixtape for the pop fan. Do you think the pop fan's going to like it? Probably not. But most game designers are the jazz fiend and most game players are the pop radio listener. And I heard that and I'm like, "Ooh, ow, that's painful. But it explains a lot. (laughs) And uh, the other thing, as I've been saying, is I've been watching Apocalypse World and, you know, sort of its its uh, progeny move through the marketplace And I played Apocalypse World for a little bit and I read it and I'm like, I don't see what this game is doing that is so different until someone explained it to me and, you know, pierced my obtuseness. And they're like, okay, it tells GMs what they can do. It tells them how to be GMs. And I'm like, well, don't people just know that? And they're like, no, Greg, people (laughs) don't just know that. (laughs) (laughs) That's why Matt Coville made so much with his Kickstarter. It's mm-hmm. like he's done a whole series of videos about how right, to GM. Right, right. And, you know, for the most part, I had, I've had i written how to GM stuff. There's a how to GM article on my website that I'm fairly happy with, but it is all 
broad brush stuff that was, you know, okay, well, assuming you already know how to run a game, here's how to run one better. And so I'm like, can we back up and assume that someone who picks this up is going to have no real grasp of how stories hang together? I'm like, okay, can I teach that person to navigate story creation at the table, which is packed full of wildness because you have to deal with unpredictable players who may have had a really bad day at work. And also then occasionally the dice are just going to hop up and say, sure, what, what, you need two 20s in a row to hit Darth Vader in the chest? Yeah, you can have those. <laughs> and we've all seen these outlier dice and mm-hmm. they're thrilling, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone has their story about the time the dice just got squirrely. Yeah. Uh, and so what I've tried to do in both games in different ways, give a, a GM a little more help and not assume that they were, you know, an English major like me. I'm like, what What if a GM was someone who hadn't always wanted to be a writer and hadn't spent their entire adolescence holed up in the library reading. <laughs> and so I took two two different approaches with it. And the one I did with Termination Shock was that I said, okay, you need to have player buy-in and you need to have player actions be important and make a difference. And I said, there's basically three options here. And one of them is tricky. The tricky one is what I call a puzzle where you present something for not the character to figure out, but the player to figure out. Uh, And there were a lot of these in like the early dungeons, right? Oh, yeah. Get some wordplay thing that you had to uh, or, or, you know, a math puzzle. Yeah, Some riddling sphinx Mm -hmm. or some weird room with like color changing tiles or something. Traps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are puzzles. The other option is decisions. And, uh, you know, this goes back to, to, you know, this is sort of the unknown armies fascination, which is, okay, you can choose between these two things, but there's consequences either way you go. You're either going to have to choose between two good things or two bad things. You decide which of these evils is the lesser and, you know, the game just goes with that. Or you decide which of these uh, benefits you're going to pursue to the exclusion of the other. And so I call those, you know, decisions, obviously enough. So it's like you got puzzles, you've got decisions, and then you've got the gamey stuff where you roll, which is when you want the absolute maximum wildness and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so then I provide sort of a pretty basic skeleton for a session, which is, all right, so decide whether your session is going to be A, you're in danger and you need to get out of danger. B, there's this opportunity. You could take it and maybe get something really great. Or C, there's a mystery. You don't know what's going on. Can you find out what's going on? So that's like the main line is going to be, you know, mystery, threat, or opportunity. And then midway through, you want to provide a choice of uh, sort of subplots. And so you could double down on uh, what you're already going after, or you could say, okay, while we're trying to survive the threat, we're also going to try and figure out a mystery that relates to where the threat came from. Or while we're trying to solve this mystery, we are going to also pursue some avenue of enrichment for ourselves or some, some benefit for ourselves. So the game, the session branches, and then you can have sub branches under those based on, again, decisions or, you know, dice challenges, or if you really want to, a puzzle. My recommendation is don't make success in the uh, session dependent on solving a puzzle. Yeah. I mean, it's better to leave it to the dice, cruel as they can be, because if you screw up because your dice got cold, well, that's no fun. But if your character fails because you, the player, 
couldn't figure out whatever obscure riddle seemed obvious to your GM, that feels like a little more personal. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it you know that that'll happen bad. when half of your party is sleep deprived too. It's like mm. everybody's like, oh yeah, that that horrible thunderstorm came through. It woke everybody up three times last night. We're all sitting here like, you know, nursing our third cup of coffee. The GM's like, well, I've got a brain teaser for you. And everybody's like, could you <laughs> not? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm sure that, and I'm sure there are groups out there who would just jump on a puzzle with both feet. So all, as always, your mileage varies. Yeah. But I wanted to set it up so players had lots of meaningful decisions but also the dice got a chance to throw wicked curveballs at everybody. But also the GM has enough structure that I'm not just handing him his trumpet and saying, oh, it's free jazz bebop play. <laughs> right. I have certainly noticed that a lot of times my notes for campaigns don't track plots so much as here's this mash of information that has been built up. What do I do with it? I, I mm. have all these NPCs and all these dangling things that I set up as like, eh, there's maybe plot over here. Here's a, a little mystery I threw out. Here's a thing. And none of it is coherent. It, like, it is all part <laughs> of a, a world, right? It's all part of a, a setting that I f hope feels realistic, but it doesn't feel like there's a actual story happening so much as a sequence of events that sometimes the players participate in. One of these days, we should pull out our notes and compare them on a stream or something. That would be fascinating. Mm. Mm. I can see it because, I mean, it looks so much different on the other side of the GM screen. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the fascinating things that's happened with Termination Shock is that I ran a campaign of it and, you know, got creatively exhausted by the end. And so Jose, one of the players, is like, oh, I could run this game. And I'm like, y yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you want to play it? I'm like, I bet I would get all kinds of crazy insights on things coming at it as a player instead of a GM. And also, I would get to chew a bunch of scenery differently. So it's been very, very enlightening to, you know, see things where I'm like, oh, this seemed really overpowered as a GM. But now that I'm a player, it just seems right. Hmm. 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 Yeah. But it's interesting that you could hand off the plot like it's it seems like it's laid out oh, pretty we well. just started over oh, okay. with new characters we started off with uh you know a different group uh with the crew of a different ship mm -hmm. post rescue but there was a really great flashback because you know he'd he'd introduced this character who was an alien and he's like yeah you trust this guy an alien named sack <laughs> and they're like you you trust sack he's he's a good one and then during the flashback we find out why we trust Sack so much, which is that he came in, saved us from this rampaging killbot, and in the process got parts of himself chewed off. And, you know, he's, he's a uh, kind of alien where their body is iterative. He's a collection of identical gas bags, but having lost a section of his bags, he would effectively be brain damaged and that he did that for us, a group of strange hairless monkeys. So we're like, yeah, okay. Yes. Sack is our friend. <laughs> so the way I did it for Grim War was a little more lit crit in that I'm like, okay, here are two sets of concepts. The first concept is the Western story. You introduce the, the conflict. There's rising action. There's a little more rising action. There's a climax. And then there's a denouement when everything falls into its new position, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what we all learned in high school English when we were reading uh, The Minister's Black Veil or what have you. Right. And uh, I'm like, so that's, you know, keep that concept in mind, that stable of concepts. On the other hand, you have types of scenes. And so... You can have an action scene in which the pieces that have been introduced are put into new positions where uncertainties are resolved through uh, forceful decision making. You know, the action scene is where you do the things you can't take back. Mm -hmm. uh, there are character scenes where you find out who the, the player characters are and what they care about and what they don't care about 
and what they're willing to do for their goals and where they're, they'll stop and say, no, that's too far. And then there are information scenes where you basically uncover the plot or allow them to uncover the plot. I find that if you give people the plot, they can't follow it. They don't care. They, uh, you know, they look at their phones. But if you make them uncover it, they will treat each clue like it's made of gold. Right. And so I say, all right. Because you've earned that clue at this point. Because mm-hmm. you've earned that clue. So each game session, you want to have introduce the situation, rising action, rising action, climax, denouement. Into each of those five or however many slots, put a scene of these three types, you know, action, character, information, and try real hard not to have the same kind of scene back to back. You don't want to go character scene, different character scene, or action scene, different action scene. Because that's when they start to feel samey or drawn out or repetitive. Each scene refreshes your desire for a different type of scene. And so I, I'm like, look, you could go, uh, you know, start off with an information scene, go to a character scene that establishes what your PC's uh, attitude towards it is. Go into more another information scene so that they can get a better grasp on how to achieve their goals, get the action scene where they're uh, achieving them, and then move into uh, another character scene where they decide whether it was really worth it. Or you could do an entirely different spread of those types of scenes. Uh, You know, you could go action, character, action, mystery, action. You almost never want to have an action scene as uh, the denouement. Uh, So you could go action character, action mystery, where they're like, oh, but this this thing we've discovered, what does it really mean? And so in this fashion, you can partially automate the creative process instead of having to look at just the blank, the blank page of, okay, what? They're coming over Friday, they're bringing pizza, they're expecting a game. You can go to, okay, I know I need to have these five things. I need to have these scenes. Each scene has to answer a question. I can't decide in advance what the answers to each scene's questions are, but I need to be prepared for the answers the players give me. But I know what type of scene each one is likely to be. So it's a little more high level than the sort of flowchart termination shock approach. Right. But I think termination shock benefits from having a little more structure in the guidance on how to run games because its mechanics can get real loose on you, even more so than the one roll engine, which is famous for, you know, oh, a good 60, 70 percent of the time, it's very predictable. And, you know, the guy with the better pool is going to pull out ahead. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the time, it'll just flip out on you and you don't know what it's doing, which I consider a feature rather than a bug. It's very dramatic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That kind of unexpectedness 30 percent of the time definitely keeps you on your toes. Yeah, that. And also, I think it leads to stories that aren't always stale. Right. (laughs) Um, I'm sorry, you rolled what helps a great deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it often often you you can then say, okay, cool. You rolled really well. Tell me what that or you rolled something completely unexpected. Tell me what that means. And the GM can hand that off. Um, The lit critch approach you're talking about for Grimoire, it does sound and this is kind of something that I have used to to learn to GM mm-hmm. reminds me somewhat of the the Robin D. Laws Hamlet hit points beating the story method, but at a higher level, which I think is easier to grasp. I think it's probably it, also more useful in an actual setting prep kind of environment too. I'm gonna go back and listen to this next time I'm prepping. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't have to track exactly what's happening within a scene. I just need to say, okay, I need A scene like this, 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 and then I need to just kind of make sure that it follows this general arc, and I should be good. And what I've suggested that you can do is you you can dial this up a level and use it for campaign design, where it's like, okay, look at your uh, single session. What types of scenes are coming up in that? I mean, is it two action scenes, 
two mystery scenes and a character scene. All right. So that session is either going to be mostly in action or, you know, mostly, which, which did I say was two? If you had a, a session with, you know, three mystery scenes in it, it's clearly the session is about mystery. Right. And I'm like, so right. now you can call that one a mystery session and say, all right, for the next one, I want it to be a session that's not quite so mystery focused. So I'm going to make sure to put in lots of action scenes or I'm going to make sure to put in lots of character scenes. And now you get the whole overarching thing is some of these sessions are going to be high action. Some of them are going to focus more on character drama and some of them are going to focus more on uncovering the mysteries concealed inside the setting. And again, if you change it up, it doesn't get boring if all you do is have action scene, action scene, action scene, action scene. I mean, even games that do that really, really well, occasionally you want to take a break from the hacking and slashing and just say, okay, let's find out what's going on with the the long-running romantic subplot. Right. I was in a D&D game for a long time that did suffer from that somewhat because the GM had convinced himself that every D&D session needed to be some character scenes, and then a fight sure. every session. Well, it's it's the tradition. Right. And we just knew the second half of the night was some fight, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> and it was telling that when we managed to put that off long enough that we had a, uh, a session that was entirely character driven, we all were like, wow, that was really good. And then none of us learned anything from it because we were new to the whole thing. <laughs> but we were like, wow, that was really good. And it stood out in our minds. I think that's one of the things that made your colony game work so well when it was running on all cylinders is we went sessions between uh, sessions, plural between fights a lot of the time. Like there was a surprisingly small amount of combat in that game, as I remember it. Well, yeah, but we we had a lot of like, what's going on over here? What do these people think about this? How do you know, there's all these other problems and stuff that was going on. It wasn't stagnant, but it was just like, OK, so. We've uncovered that there's another friendly, sapient group of, you know, people that are of a different type that we've never met before on this island. What are they like? You know? Sure. And certainly left to my own devices, it would have been nothing but information scenes. Uh, but thankfully, I have players and they like to do things. So mm -hmm. it's a nice, healthy balance in our gaming group, thankfully. And I'd like kind of the fractal model that you're describing where you lay out a scene and then you look at that and say – let me do the same thing, but at a meta level for this arc that I'm on. And then I can take that whole arc, you know, and say, okay, this is one part of the campaign that I'm running. Matryoshka dolls. Yeah, yeah. exactly. This session is going to be kind of like this, but it fits into the non-repeating pattern I'm trying to build that covers this whole arc. And then if we have a couple of these arcs, I can put those into a campaign that is about this, but doesn't feel repetitive. Yeah. And I mean, you can't plan things out too far in advance because your players just won't have it. They <laughs> uh, they have too much agency. Yeah, typically. And your dice won't let you have it either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you wind it, up with if, like a throwaway melee encounter being a like redeemed ally of theirs that's probably going to show up later in the campaign. Yeah. But I do think yeah. that you can use this to adjust on the fly because you can yes. say – I can look back at the notes I took on the past couple of sessions and say, we're leaning a little heavy on this. Let me try and push things more towards information scenes or, or character scenes or something like that, because we haven't had enough of those. Let me lean into that a little bit. And then you can look at it and say, you know, this whole last arc, we really had a lot of action. Let me focus a little more on some character scenes, maybe by introducing some NPCs who aren't combatants. They just want to talk and they are connected to this backstory thing that one of our uh, players came up with and we've forgotten about. So I've got a good or a bunch there. of repercussions of the action. Sure. Always a classic. You can use it to adjust and, you know, you can't right. plan too far in the future, but you can certainly look backwards and say, let me change direction a little. Well, the bi the best conflict from uh, the last session of uh, Termination Shock I played was a social conflict. And, you know, the other thing that has popped up out of the dice. OK, the best weird random dice artifact that has come up in the current season of, of uh 
Termination Shack, which exists as a bunch of unprocessed audio on my hard drive. One of the major villains is this sort of it's like if you cross the Borg with multi-level marketing, it's this, <laughs> this evil fascistic corporation that just wants to remake you into the perfect productive consumer hmm. through violating your biology with terrible nanotechnology. My liver uh, slid up so, between my lungs and is hiding hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, the very first time we encounter them, we're like, well, what can we do? You know, they're preparing orbital bombardments. There's no way we can possibly face them on an equal footing. Uh, like, let's try and hack their computer. And just the dice are like, yeah, their infosec is crap. So we're like, oh. <laughs> And in the process, convinced them that, oh, yeah, no, we're we're here. We're legitimately here to pick up the MacGuffin they sent us from Fleet Command headquarters. Load her up the back. We're taking that MacGuffin. <laughs> and then, you know, flew away with the MacGuffin. And they're like, no, that was what we blew up a whole planet to steal. <laughs> <laughs> and later and every single time. We tried to intrude on their cybersecurity. The dice are like, oh, yeah, you can totally do that. <laughs> you just waltz right in. <laughs> and so it became this wonderful running joke of, oh, yeah, they think their cybersecurity is good, but it's really not. <laughs> That's excellent. Yep. Sometimes the dice are your friends. Yeah. But they're never your reliable friend. They're never the friend who helps you move. No. <laughs> the dice are, like, in, in the group of Marx brothers, <laughs> the dice are Harpo Marx. They are the chaos agent of the game. <laughs> and they will pull through on bringing chaos to either the GM or the players, rarely both. <laughs> The dice are your. The dice aren't the friend who will help you move. The dice are your friend that you want to go to Atlantic City with. <laughs> yeah, but you're always worried that they're going to take things a little too far, right? And just leave you stranded. There's a complex metaphor there if we want to pursue it. But <laughs> I'm like, that was an, that was an oddly specific uh, comment there, Grant. Is this? Are we uncovering no, backstory? No, no, no. This is this is interesting. I like both of these approaches. I'm actually personally leaning more towards the the termination shock model where you have these very uh, delineated plots because I feel like my game in particular, the way IGM could stand for some actual plot structure. <laughs> and also, I've really always liked the idea of um, B plots, and I feel like mm. not enough GMs consciously track B plots. Something I think everybody does is, you know, this is the plot that we are engaged in right now. This is the overarching story. Great. But then they don't track the B plot and then connect it back into the A plot in some way. Right. Well, and and one approach is just to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Right. Yeah. If you're the kind of person who does a lot of their creativity between game sessions as opposed to – so you're you're like a classical composer – who wants to prepare everything in advance and then have it all deploy harmoniously instead of being the bebop improviser who gets thrown a rhythm at the table and just riffs on it. One thing you will probably do is you'll have this gigantic backlog of, of characters and situations ready to grab one out of, at a moment's notice. And it can be, I think it can be uh, very useful Instead of asking yourself, okay, what thing can I add now when things are slowing down to look at, okay, how can I create an interaction between the things I've already established? And, you know, with the A plot and the B plot, it's like, okay, it's not just where are they at with the A plot? Where are they at with the B plot? And I can switch them between the two, two tracks when one starts to get boring. It's like, what happens when you multiply the A plot by the B plot? What happens when elements from the two of them influence each other? Mm, yeah. But that's not something you can prepare beforehand. That's something you have to dance as fast as you can during the actual session. Yeah, and I'm actually right. finding the second approach compelling because left to my own devices and without consciously working against it, I basically wind up like force feeding my player group a fire hose of urgency throughout the entire mm -hmm. game. Which I works. ran a D&D &D campaign back in the day that 
went from level five to level 22, I want to say, <laughs> over the course of about a year and a half of real time. Now, these were this was back when everybody had free time and we were doing like six to eight hour sessions. Sure. Oh, but back in my day, we'd play Dungeons and Dragons for six hours at a stretch. Yeah. I <laughs> was just fine. Oh, yeah. Nobody looked at their days. cell phones because we didn't have them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that. yes, that was my birthright game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was, that was, this was like back around 2005, 2006 ish or so. Um, but at any rate, like, we sat down after the campaign had ended. And the story had actually wrapped up, and we figured out about how much time had passed, and it was like a month and a half of in-game time. It was just like, go, 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 the whole time. It's like, oh boy, these people would have just dropped from the stress at some point instead of like saving Did the world ever multiple sleep? times. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Jose, who's running the uh, the game right now, has uh, been fairly. Ca- he- he cares more, I think, about keeping the the calendar of the game tidy than the rest of us put together. And at some <laughs> point, he was, you know, doing his arcane GM calculations. He's like, yeah, so it's been, wow, like 19 months since you arrived at the station. I'm like, it can't have been that long. And he's like, well, you know, we had waived a lot of travel times. So huh. I'm like, oh, OK, all right. Yeah, I was very bad about tracking time in our last D and D game, and did anyone care? I did. Uh, <laughs> none of your players did. <laughs> um, I I really like. I probably hand wave too much, but eh. yeah. But we're also doing a much more episodic game in in yours, so I yeah, think it's okay. Yeah, very much. All right, Greg. Thank you for taking the time to talk yeah, with us. No we problem. really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Jenny, anything yeah. you want to add to this? Not especially because most of my games, I, I, I do one shots like that. That's mm. what I do. So in terms of campaign stuff, I don't really have a whole heck of a lot to add. I will say also that I prefer a sandboxy approach. The most recent game I ran was I was working off of a module and it was deeply unsettling to me <laughs> to not be able to improvise on the fly. I'm much more of an improv GM than you're free jazz i'm very i actually genuinely enjoy free jazz i listen to free jazz mm-hmm. in my spare time like Excellent. i'm i'm a free jazz kind of person so so you're the one okay <laughs> <laughs> so I, my my yeah. theory about jazz is that it is much it has to be much more fun to play than listen to but mm. that may just be me being unkind well you you and my wife would get along very well we have had <laughs> long arguments about whether or not jazz counted as music oh Ow. wow so yeah chrissy is um she might she might be right about kiwi but she's not right about uh everything else I, i'm yeah. being a little harsh but she and i yeah. do not have the same musical taste at all oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your, your wife actually shares my musical taste much more closely which is to yeah. say a lot of heavy metal so yeah but yeah anyway i do think i try to go more for the setup rising action rising action climax denouement kind of thing I, I try to go for that. Yeah, I don't exactly, like, set a pace. Every now and then, I will have to be a little forceful in, like, okay, we've had the setup for, like, a solid hour now. It's time for rising action. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, you have something happen them. immediately. It's time to go. But for the and most part, I'm very And if you have a lot form. of free time and you can mm-hmm. stretch, you know, what was going to be one session out into three, that can be okay because sometimes yeah. – the setup is really interesting oh yeah for sure but i run convention games where we have a four-hour slot well yeah exactly so yeah what's funny is the the example i'm thinking of somebody on our discord had asked about call of cthulhu and like hey does anybody have a good actual play and as it turns out one of the episodes of role-playing public radio i sent greg was Mm -hmm. the one that um uh, is it adam scott glancy Ran. Oh, dig for victory. Dig for victory. Yes. <laughs> and, and that was less a Call of Cthulhu game than a lot of fascinating World War One trivia with a Shoggoth. <laughs> and I loved it. You know, I can see how that would aggravate people. But like I was there like this is just fascinating World War One history. And then yeah. also there's some digging and a Shoggoth. And it worked out really well. But that hour or two of setup got everyone yeah. into it. Mm-hmm. The fact that it was a con game frankly amazed me. Like I I was astonished that 
It was not an official convention oh, game. Okay. It was a run at one of the tables out in an open space for, you know, hours and hours. Yes. So, yeah, that was not th- that was one where Ross got some unbelievably lucky roll. But uh, it was U-Boats Harouse where he got just the really, really, really unbelievable set of rolls. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. I don't know what he's got going, but if I was a deep one, I'd make a sand roll when I saw him coming. So. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, um, yeah, not I, the I, first time I've made that joke, but I like it. It's a good joke. So good. Good jokes repeated for new audiences. You know, <laughs> they work. But yeah, Jenny, like, yeah, I love the setup. But you know, you're right. In a con game, mm-hmm. sometimes you have to say. Let's get going, folks. Please. Yes. Let's do yeah. the, Let's do TikTok, things. TikTok. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a guy at, at a, a, he was GMing a uh, Cthulhu Invictus game at a convention, literally watch his watch as we discussed things. And he would like count down. I, I think I was the only one who noticed him doing this. And after a while, he would bang on the table and it's like, sand check. <laughs> Wow. What? <laughs> okay, too far. Too far. Pull my, it back. My approach to convention games has always been just, you know, here's a bunch of characters with incompatible motives. Here's an extremely unstable situation. Uh, you know, just let the rampage begin. <laughs> yeah. You know, if they if yeah. they do nothing, everything's going to collapse and they'll have to react to that. So you and like the gift from Burning Wheel? Oh, was that the one with uh, the three? The three of you grab the same thing at the the same time because you've you've all no. It's the it's the elves and the dwarves, and it's like this tense diplomatic thing. But the elves didn't bring a uh, forgot to actually bring a gift, and the dwarves are greedy, and they think that various things that the elves have on them might be it. And it's no, I haven't read that one or played it. So yeah, or if I if I I know I haven't played it if I've. If I've read it, it was long ago and I've forgotten it, alas. That was my introduction to Burning Wheel. It was a fascinating scenario. <laughs> <laughs> what you just described, Greg, very much explains why you wrote uh, the jailbreak scenario for, for Unknown Armies, where it's just, here's completely incompatible sides. Mm-hmm. Y'all have fun. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the first one where I did it, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just just kind of flailing around. I'm like, oh, this sounds like it would be fun to do. I'd run a lot of games uh, and made up a lot, but not published a lot of them at that point. But it worked so well that I've just been I'm like, oh, let's go back to that. Well, <laughs> yeah, that functions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> jailbreak, for those who don't know, is a unknown army scenario where one side of the table, as it were, is playing escape convicts and the other side is playing their prisoners. Yep. And and things are not as they seem. Yeah, mostly because the place they've broken into was a terrible place to break into and hide out from a hailstorm in. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's it's a delightful scenario. I strongly recommend it. So I've never not had fun running that. It's one of those great setups where as a GM, you can sort of uh, deputize the other players to torment each other for you. It's like, I don't have to make trouble for these people. They're all trouble. Right. <laughs> Well, Greg, thank you again for coming on. Really do appreciate you taking the time to to talk to us about Termination Shock and Grim War and everything else and, and this complicated topic of plotting games and making sure scenarios are successful. Uh, it's been really Trying good. to make it a little yeah. easier. So yeah, It's yeah. always good to have you. Yeah, so That's thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. So cool. Invite me back any old time. Oh, we, we will take you up on that. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. <laughs> if somebody wants to find you on the internet and find more of your work, where should they go? The first resource would be gregstolze.com. That's just G-R-E-G-S-T-O-L-Z-E dot com. Uh, it's got some free games, uh, a lot of downloads, and I try to keep it up uh, to date with whatever I'm doing at the moment in the realms of gaming and fiction. And I'm on Twitter as Greg Stolze. I'm fortunate enough to have a name that's got decent search engine optimization built in. (laughs) Uh, I will also make sure to link our previous episode with Greg Stolze uh, when we had him back on in episode 83 to talk about personal horror. Uh, So I'll make sure that that is in the show notes as well. And I think this is a pretty good place to wrap this one up. Anybody else got anything right. right at the end? Nope. Okay, cool. I think I'm good, good to go. All right. All right. Well, Greg, Groovy. thank you again. Thank you. And from all of us here at Saving the Game, have a good one. Take it easy. You too. We'll catch you next all time. Right. See Talk ya. to you later.
This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.